I mean, what can you say about this? It's one of the most recognizable songs ever. One that's dominated pop culture as much as any piece of music in the modern era. Long list of TV and film placements covered by hundreds of artists. This classic rock standard has become an immortal entry in the pages of music history. And yet, the band called it a wild card song. They absolutely never expected it would do anything close to what it's done. Today, we're giving you the definitive story on the making of this number one 80s hit straight from the band members. Now, this one is a blast. It's a behind the scenes look at how they really feel about the song. Coming up next on Professor of Rock. Hey music junkies, Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. You know, if you remember counting down the top 40 hits with Casey Kasem, the American Top 40, every single week, you're gonna dig this channel. It's really a throwback, a tribute to him. Make sure to subscribe below right now so that you know when our latest and greatest videos are coming out. And uh, check us out on Patreon for even more content or interviews there. So I'm excited to bring you yet another episode from our series, Revelations, my favorite. It's where featured artists reveal rare stories about their biggest songs, their biggest albums, insight you won't find anywhere else. I gotta tell you, this one's a good one. This installment of Revelations, uh, very fortunate to sit down with Toto member Steve Lukather and uh, David Page, also Steve Percaro. Talk about their enduring 80s classic, Africa. I miss the rain. I've had the honor of interviewing Steve Lukather and David Page uh, many times. Gotta tell you, in all the conversations we've had, you can definitely feel the, the respect and the admiration that they have for each other. It's a riot every time. Luke and Page, two of the nicest guys in the industry, and you can tell that you know selling millions and millions of records hasn't gone to their heads at all. Maybe I should say half a billion records since Lukather and David Page have worked on hundreds of albums from the mid 70s on. Uh, the members of Toto have had a very illustrious extracurricular career, indeed, working on Michael Jackson Thriller. Also working with Paul McCartney, Pink Floyd, Eagles, Eddie Van Halen. They composed the score for the 1984 edition of Dune. So many. Within the band, Toto has had a slew of US Top 40 hits. We've covered a lot of them here. Hold the Line 99. Rosanna, Make Believe, I Won't Hold You Back. I'll be over you without your love. Pamela, just to name a few. Through, and their 1982 album, Total Four, fittingly reached number four on the Billboard 200 chart. But among all these bragging rights, there's one song that has persisted more than any other one that is instantaneously connected with Toto, it's Africa. Yeah, if you didn't know, Africa was and is kind of a big deal. Went to number one on the Billboard Hot 100, also went to number three on the US Cashbox chart, went to number five on the US AC chart. Internationally, it broke the top 10 in a number of countries, number eight in Belgium, number seven in Austria, number six in Switzerland, number five in Australia and New Zealand, to number four in the Netherlands, number three in the UK, number two in Ireland, and it went to number one in Canada. Incidentally, uh, in South Africa, it went to number 18. Should have done better. Now, as we go into this interview, I do want to thank our sponsor, Zenny Eyewear, the glasses I always jam. If you want to get Zenny's latest deals, and the easiest way to order and design them, you got to download the Zenny app to your phone right now. Check that out. You're going to love it. Just go to the App Store, type in Zenny, Z-E-N-N-I. Here's Toto with the definitive story of Africa. I miss the rains down in Africa. 
Africa. Let's talk about that pop culture phenomenon. Tell me about how it came together. We had most of the Toto 4 album done. And I started, I got a new instrument called a, a GS1 from Yamaha. Mm -hmm. And it had these little kind of kalimba, Balinesian, gamelan kind of sounds in it. And uh, we had a CS80 in my living room. My, my house had keyboards everywhere. And you could plug them in and record also. We're using this synthesizer called a GS1. It was this Yamaha, it was a $16,000 digital instrument that you couldn't program. They only had two or three of these programmers for it. Four screen. It was a very early application of FM synthesizers, which is what the DX7 wound up being. But this GS1 was in this other model of it. And it had amazing sounds and had this amazing characteristic. But uh, this guy named Gary Lewinberger was his name. Very dear friend of ours who was helping us programming stuff. He came in, and especially for Africa, we spent hours, hours on tweaking those kalimba sounds. You know what I mean? Getting that sound just right. He helped us out doing a custom custom program. That's how in with Yamaha I was yeah, in those yeah, days yeah. too, that I was able to do that. No one, you know, they didn't do custom programming for anybody. I just was that in with all those guys and uh, we really squeaked that out. And that was for Africa. And I started playing this riff and we started, I started getting into this song and wrote this little chord structure and had a chorus. I had the chorus to it. And I, once I got my title, which was Africa, I realized, well, if I'm going to do this and it's going to be anything worth it, we can't just cut it regular. So I asked Jeff to compose a special loop that was integral to the part of it. It just wasn't an afterthought to make him part of the song, you know. And I said, I want, to start, I want you to start the song with the loop. Yeah. And we'll add all this stuff to it one at a time. Almost like the Beatles were doing, and like Brian Wilson, who you talked about there, did, which is putting instruments on one at a time. Yeah. It was very experimental, very fun for us. You have some of this older school technology, Steve was saying before, about this collaborative effort where everybody's in the room and you're printing the echo and you're, we're kind of the last of the bands that saw the old school of making records on tape and utilizing how tape is, you know what I mean, an echo and all that stuff. Well, also, you know, you know, when I mean? we did Africa, we were doing like tape loops, actual tape loops on microphone stands. Al Schmidt, style, legendary you know? engineer, was working yeah. with us. And, you know, we were doing like yeah. Lenny Castro, who's out with us now. Yeah. And Jeff would come up and find four, eight bars of a loop. And then we'd start overdubbing yeah. to that. And it was really old school. Analog, analog. You know what I mean? That I mean, like, well, you got tape. How in do we room. do this? You guys you know? have seen tape loops, real tape loops, right? Where you get just a pole and a pole. Tape is spinning yeah. around the room right yeah. here. And, then like and if you want it longer, you have to move the microphone wow. stand a little you know, bit more like We're not singing this. up two machines. We gotta, we're made of one of the, the in Africa. To, you know? Instead of sampling things, we used to fly it in like wild. So you'd have to do yeah. it manually. Like, you know, the, like the background yeah. vocals would be like this ooze or something like that. You didn't want right. to do it again. You put it on the two track and you'd have to go one, bam, and yeah. anticipate it and hope that it catches up in time. Yeah. Yeah. That's how they did. And wow. we did that because we heard George Martin did that with Sgt. Peppers. Yeah, right. They would wild yeah. sync it in and then edit the pieces together. Otherwise, you had to do what we did in the first couple albums, which is sing every single chorus and triple every single chorus Jeez. and do all that. And it's very time consuming. That's yeah. where budgets went and that's what took so long with making uh, real productive albums. That waiting for you. That waiting for me. <laughs> you know, as I sit here and look at this table, though, and you like to go back and show talk about the history and where things come from. I pay homage. We're standing on the shoulders of giants. I know people say say that as a cliche, but we really are. No, yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, it all started with the Beatles for me, and then, yeah. you know, that's always, they're always in the room with whatever we do. Absolutely. I mean, yeah, 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 yeah. They know it or not, you know. <laughs> they, they made the initial loop, and once I put on the little keyboard, uh, the CS80 with the horn sound and the guide vocal, he started hearing parts, and he picked up a guitar and started doing amazing things. Hungate did. And it just came, it was so organic and collaborative. That's a perfect yeah, we example made, of Yeah, we total, basically you know made I mean? the essence of the record in one day. And then the more keyboards, and then more guitars, and then we spent a lot of time yeah. doing the rest yeah, of it. Yeah, and what was great about that is because most of the record, the rest of the record was done, and I think all we were working on was this song. It's like, so someone will get an idea, let's get Tim Schmidt from the Eagles to come in and sing yeah, this part. Yeah, yeah. Or let's get... Uh, Joe Percaro on Flapamba or bass marimba to play this part. Yeah. Then we start calling in and getting the exotic uh, uh, percussion. Yeah, Emil Richards and all you know his stuff, I mean? you know. One by one, guys start picking up their instruments. What's so great about Toto 
is their ability to self-arrange and self-produce these mm-hmm. things, you know what I mean? No one tells him what part to play on that or David Hungate what bass part to play. And uh, right. it just kind of evolved while we were mixing our record, you know? Yeah. And uh, it was one of those magical things. You know, you can't say, hey, well, we masterminded this to be a big single and right. saw the no, future. No, I didn't hear it, man. I was going like, uh, we, none of I us go, did, go, really. You know? I didn't even make the record, right? No, because yeah. it's such a mid-tempo. It's kind of an easygoing thing. We had all these other... You know, the Rosannas and these uh, you right. know, big rockers on there. We thought, well, here's another little extra. It was truly song, a you know? wild card song. Yeah, you know? yeah. And then it ends up being the biggest song we've ever had. So what you, we know? Got, you know, certainly. I was never one to pick the singles, you know. You know, the Africa I remember very well because I remember, and I didn't even know this about Luke. Luke has come out about this, too. Mm-hmm. I, I just remember the whole time with Africa thinking, this does not belong on this album. Mm-hmm. This should not be on this record. It was kind of the last thing we'd working on. We'd already been working on all, you know, the whole thing. And yeah. My tune, we'd gone through all this stuff. It was not all this stuff. And Africa was kind of this thing of David's. And I could tell David was way into it and really wanted to do it. And Jeff worked really hard on it. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Um, having said that, just because I didn't like the tune and because I didn't think it should be on the album doesn't mean I didn't kill myself on it. You know what I'm mm-hmm. saying? We mm-hmm. would really, like I said, again, just to finish up what I was saying about the guys, as hard as they could be on you working on their stuff, when it was my stuff, they all brought their A-games. Yeah. And I never felt for a moment that Lukather was just trying to get through my tune so he could get to work on one of his tunes. He always, everybody always gave brought it, it. Gave it everything. Everyone always brought it. You can it. tell that. With all you guys' songs. I mean, they're what so What David would bring ridiculous. to my songs. Yeah. What David would bring to my songs, you know? Yeah. You know, and I loved it because I brought yeah. a lot to, you know what I mean? I'd work hard on his tunes too. Yeah. So, You also were ri- watching a documentary, right? As far as the lyrics go. No, oh, not so much. I was okay. reading a lot of National Geographic at the okay. time is what I was doing. I got a lot of stuff from, there from poetically paraphrasing uh, some of the things. And I had, uh, you know, read, read some books and stuff and, uh, and was kind of romanticizing about going to Africa, which I'd never been. Classic rock has sort of taken, a, you know, it's crossed generations now. Oh, yeah. Like, you know. No question. You know, my younger kids know, my older kids do. They all find it on their own. You get the songs in video games and stuff like oh, that. Yeah. The cross-pollinization of stuff. Yeah, stuff. It's on a, a cartoon show or something. Yeah, right. lap. That's the other thing. A whole bunch of people, their first introduction into us is either Jimmy Fallon and Justin Timberlake. Hot glass of rain down in Africa. Gonna taste the time. Or Family Guy, you know what I mean? I love the show. Yeah. I'm a huge Seth MacFarlane fan, you know? When he did Africa, yeah. I didn't know it was coming. Yeah. I was just watching the show, I go, Paige! I call him, I call him, put on TV! That's we awesome. love it. We love it, you know what I, I mean? Know. Luke watches all those shows in South Park. I remember I was watching this show. It was I didn't start watching it until it was in syndication. It was called Scrubs. Yeah. And I loved I love it. Scrubs. I thought it was yeah. hysterical. And one episode, you know what I mean? One episode, they open on his iPod. He's in the bathtub, and they open on his iPod, and it says Toto Africa on it. Only one thing could make it better. Cranking up the Toto. Yeah. You know what I mean? I'm going, oh, yeah. oh boy. What's, <laughs> what are we going to be the punchline for now? But it was very... He loved it. Yeah. We loved well, it. Jerry Fallon. How do you not laugh yeah, at that? That's classic, man. Classic. I mean, I thought when I, when I got the sync request, I thought that what usually happens is, oh, it's a walk on and they play five seconds of it. Boom, yeah. boom, 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 boom. Ladies yeah. and gentlemen, Justin Timberlake and everything. And they kept coming back to it. And these guys have braces on. Oh, and they're like hilarious. Little, it, was, it was hysterical. They're sitting there singing it to each oh, other. It's, it's, it's classic. No, they cut back to in sync, but back when they were together, like yeah. they were in Africa and they were all singing the song. Yeah. That yeah. song is like. No one laughs about our stuff at our stuff more than we do. Oh, you know we, well, are you kidding me? We, we, you we guys, put, you we guys have seen that thing on, on YouTube list. Yeah. where yeah. The, that huge uh, choir is singing Africa? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's incredible. <laughs> Yeah, we played with them. Jazz, yeah. uh, Perpetuum Jazz. Yeah, they came on stage and they did it with us. Stage. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And then yeah. Andy McKee. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. that's a really talented amazing. Guy. Well, that got me in touch with Andy McKee, which yeah. I brought him in. And yeah. then Lee Rittenauer did this album called Six String uh, Theory. 
and and we he came in he was part of this the band the, yeah. you know, one of the tracks yeah. and he's a brilliant Super guitar talent. player i heard that africa was a drinking game in college or something like that <laughs> so, certain lyric and you had to pound a shot or something like that. Yeah, it was I a drinking was game very, when very i wrote funny. it it was a drinking game when i wrote yeah, it yeah yeah no, definitely <laughs> we, we were definitely a little tight could could have been slightly altered right. at the time of the recording yeah. Yeah. And then the weezer version hit number one introduced to yet another generation you think of that really good there was a version of two guys two weekend warriors at, at a pizza place yes i know those really guys. Yeah. guitar and bass and it was like one of the coolest versions yeah, they did a great job you know what i mean it. their vocal was really yeah. good yeah oh yeah that guy Solid. showed up one we of just our met that yeah yeah, yeah we just yeah, saw in it. utah man we just saw he came to the show ah. he was videos. really good yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah he was really sweet too a lot of kids found our music. Like we, we're yeah. this multi generational, you know, fan base at this point. You know, yeah. we look out the yeah. audience. It's not just people our age. It's a lot of young people. Cool. Africa reached number one on February fifth, nineteen eighty three, and it stayed there for a solitary week. The four other songs that made it to the top five when Africa went to number one. Uh, number five was "Shame on the Moon" by Bob Seger and the Silver Bullet Band. At number four, Baby Come to Me, a duet by, uh, of course, Patty Austin and James Ingram. Number three was Sexual Healing by Marvin Gaye. And number two, Down Under by Men at Work. It's a great top five, but I dare say, you know, Africa with over 2 billion streams and counting, they've outpaced them all, really all of them put together. Just such a great song. What do you remember about this song and about Toto? Share your memories below. Let's have a great talk about it. what's your favorite use in pop culture. I love uh, what Jimmy Fallon and Justin Timberlake did with it. Uh, let's have some great memories talking about Africa. If you like this video, we do invite you to subscribe below. We'd love to have you. Until next time, three chords and the truth, my friends. <laughs>